Better player in my time. Bid's very presence on the field was intimidatory to the bowlers he was facing. He comes out to bat for the West Indies in front of 90,000, and it was his patch. I mean, it was just staggering. It was almost as if he was taking on the rest of the world on behalf of the downtrodden Africans who'd gone to the Caribbean as slaves, and he felt very strongly about that. Every inning, every test series carried with it some issue of the black movement. If he didn't own the cricket field after the first ball, he did after the second, because that was the way he made his mark. Smack. We walk to the middle, we can see ball is the thing, start thinking, you know? He had that kind of presence. I'd never tell him at the time, but he was my favourite player. I used to love watching him play. The dominant a batsman, he's a great fieldsman, he's the greatest player. Put it this way, if we were going to cricket war and they wanted a batsman to take me and take me, which is... When you have a sport that is more recognisable in a big way, the three W's came to mind, Wes Hall, Charlie Griffith and people like that. I gravitated certainly to, to the sport itself, it's, uh, even though I was multi-purpose where sports were concerned. We first played for Antigua together in 1969, and I played first-class cricket for Leeward Islands in 1970. But Viv didn't make it until 1971. He represented um, the Leeward Islands and Combined Islands. Whilst making a name for himself in his home country, Isaac Vivian Alexander Richards was spotted by Somerset Vice Chairman Len Creed. The Mandy Paycorns was a private little club that the, the chairman of Somerset was uh, involved with. And they used to, uh, in the winter, go have a week or two out in the West Indies. They said to me, um, wow, these guys are somewhat county cricketers and I felt if I was going to get an opportunity against them, it would be nice to, to show off your skills. I guess I had some brilliance in the field, and Chairman just decided, wow, well, I've got to take this guy back up to Somerset. Richard's first impressed for Lansdowne Cricket Club in Bath, before joining Somerset, where he met a man who would become a lifelong friend, Ian Botham. I was supposed to be doing the batting at the time, and I think I fell out for a duck and Ian went out and scored 100. I can remember he was supposed to be this hot bowler who, who was just burst on the scene. And I don't think he took any wickets. And I ended up getting, I think it was five for 25. I can remember he came in the end and he said, hey, from now on, I'm going to do the batting and you will do, do the bowling. And we became, we hit it off right there and then. The talent of both players was obvious, though still raw. But in the Somerset captain and England veteran, Brian Close, they found a mentor. It was a thrill and enjoyment to have them in the team and to see them developing the skills. I've always looked upon Brian as being a hard nut, an individual who doesn't budge, battered and bruised and wouldn't um, flinch an inch. So I felt, wow, that's the perfect sort of example. You needed someone like Brian Close to just give you a clip around the air and 
just pull you, rein you in a little bit. Even if I had a scratch, I didn't want to complain about it because I knew that we had a leader who would go through all the hazardous stuff that it takes in order for his team to, to be successful. Richards made 81 on his Somerset debut and within six months had caught the eye of the national selectors. In November 1974, he was selected for the West Indian tour to India. From the very first knock, I think I got scores of three and four. And I felt, wow, this doesn't look like um, uh, it, it's a happy place for me. He struggled against Chandra Sekh. I think got him both times in single figures in that first test. And everyone was doubting, well, can Richards handle it? Can he handle it? Maybe luckily, Chandra Sekh didn't play in the second test. And he just dominated. And he knew then that a new star had, had arrived. We were in a hole and he dug us out of the hole. We went on to make 192. I had never felt that I had sussed it, but I felt that um, it was going to be a little easier having scored maybe your first 100 in the opposition backyard. You could see the transformation, you know, of Viv Richards from an ordinary cricket, cricketer to an international cricketer. That first innings, you know, was a marvel. Under the captaincy of Clive Lloyd, the West Indies were ready to reveal their potential to a wider audience. In 1975, England hosted the first ever World Cup, and the final saw the West Indies face Australia. I can remember Clive Lloyd saying way back when, they're not the best runners in the wicket at the time. There used to be a lot of yes-nos in terms of decision-making. And very close, yes, he's running out. I was always a fieldsman who attacked the ball anyway. I always felt that if he had the ball to me, I was going to run you out, and if you took that chance, and they did. Oh, and this must be a run out here. He must be out. He had as much effect on the West Indies winning that match as Clive Roy did with his magnificent wonder. For West Indians living in Britain, World Cup glory offered some respite from the daily hardships of substandard housing, low income, and discrimination. Black Britons and West Indians alike had now found an idol in Richards, someone to lift the gloom, and for whom cricket was a statement of solidarity with his countrymen. When you came here, you discovered that if you were black, you were inferior. That was the ethos. It is almost like you now were driven to prove your point. You were driven to meet the British on the basis of absolute equality or not meet them at all. And we were ready to take the one on cricket. In 1976, they did just that. And their determination was fueled further by comments from England captain Tony Gregg. We were watching the 6.45 news. You must remember, the, the West Indians, these guys, if they get on top, they are magnificent cricketers. But if they're down, they grovel. And I intend, with the help of Klausi and a few others, to make them grovel. There's our motivator, Tony Gregg. The whole of Brixton heard Tony Gregg. And what is important is he had no idea of the impact his bull would make. That's your belief, that's your belief. Uh, that's your thinking. I, I, I will never ever knock you for that. But uh, when you have folks you know, who are reasonably conscious about the stuff said, and how it's been said. That was the greatest motivator, I guess, that we needed. What do you think of the West Indies team this year? Oh, we can murder them. We got them. We can murder them. Who's going to do the murdering? Oh, dear Vivian Richard. The first test was at Trent Bridge, and England soon realised that no one, least of all Tony Gregg, was going to make Vivian Richards grovel. Superb shot, half volley, pitch round about next time. That was Viv's summer. You know, he scored 232. He played as well as I've seen anybody play. And the challenge answered, and a terrific shot. England, under Tony Gregg, had the idea of having a defensive field against him, but it didn't make any difference to Viv. He just smashed the ball where there weren't any fielders. And a tremendous performance is by Vivian Richards. 200 in a test match on this ground. 
England escaped with a draw in the first two tests, but the third at Old Trafford saw Richard score 135 in the second innings on the way to a 425-run victory. Roy Fredericks and Gordon Greenwich both hit centuries in the fourth test to give the West Indies an unassailable 2-0 lead. With the series win assured, the final test at the Oval saw Richards finish in style with an outstanding first inning score of 291. That's a glorious shot, glorious stroke. We had a motley array of bowlers who he just destroyed, it didn't matter who Greggy put on. He just arrogantly swaggered about in the middle and smashed them for four or six. It was a truly remarkable knock. I've always felt it's one of the better places to bat. You get good value for your shots in terms of the way the cricket grounds ran, the ball ran to the boundary, the scene was, uh, was excellent. So um, I guess um, in England to me it was always a great place to, to, to bat. The West Indies' first inning score of 687 was their highest total in England. The host slumped to a 3-0 series defeat, much to the delight of a West Indian crowd and the embarrassment of Captain Tony Gregg. Talk is one thing, action is another. And to me, it was like um, someone was trying to mount you off and never quite have the tools to do it with. You know? And to me, that was a perfect example. Richards completed the series with 829 runs to his name and was now the first superstar of Caribbean cricket since the Garfield Sobers. Clive Lloyd may have been the captain, but Richards was the figurehead. Not just a cricketer, but a fully fledged icon. We talk about bowlers intimidating batsmen, but Viv's very presence on the field was intimidatory to the bowlers he was facing. But also wanted to impose himself even walking onto the field. His entry onto the pitch was, was an event in itself. He would always wait for the batsman who'd been dismissed to get right off the field before he swaggered out to the middle. Walked onto the field with a swagger which said, I am here and I'm going to take you on. He came out and that pump and the bat handle had that swagger. Jaws masticating his chewing gum. Never wore a helmet so you could see his features. Maroon cap of the West Indies proudly on his head. His presence at the crease was second to none. Looking around, quick tap of the pitch. He owned that little area he was standing in. He had a set of shells around his neck and on that black, beautiful body, you know, and his glisten. Next day I was down the beach looking for those bloody shells. I was thinking if he's got shells around his neck, it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. It's about asserting yourself and ultimately having these things on board was part of that assertion package. And bringing that confidence to the middle, um, that's half the job done. The ensuing years saw the West Indians stake their claim as arguably cricket's greatest ever team. In 1979, they returned to England to defend their World Cup crown. But in the final against the hosts, at 99 for four, they were in trouble until Richards Wow, I'm saying to myself, man, wow. When Collis got out, I picked it up after. When Viv uh, goes to 100 or wherever he got, and Collis King, I think, got 80 in no time, uh, we were struggling a little bit then <laughs> against their attack. That itself, um, scoring 100 at Lords, this to me, um, I've always felt the mecca. 1978 had seen Somerset lose the Gillette Cup final to Sussex, but that proved to be the catalyst for success. The following year saw Richard score 117 to help defeat Northants in the final before they added the John Player League title for the county's first trophies in their 96-year history. When we lost in 1978, that was a huge blow to me as a captain, but also to the side. I've never seen anybody in such a temper as Viv, for example, when we lost. Smashed his bat and all sorts of things. There was a, a certain will to win, to win, to win. Well, that was fantastic. The great innings, of course. In 1981, Somerset won the Benson and Hedges Cup. Richards provided a match-winning knock of 132. We were five for two. Sylvester Clark, one of the most fearsome bowlers you could ever, ever face. He went down and just blasted it. Hit him two or three times into the man's and virtually the game was over.
With two more trophies added in two more years, it was a golden age for Somerset, and Richards more than played his part. He intimidated bowlers and normal county bowlers. He just took the mickey out of and launched them either into the churchyard at one end or to the river tone at the other end. It was a real privilege to have played at the same time as the best batsman of all time. Viv Richards was the man for any occasion, flamboyant and big hitting, but readily accepting the responsibilities bestowed upon him. He was always ready to bat, and that is the kind of person that you will want. Some folks look at it as uh, maybe being arrogant or tired. But I just backed myself, you know, I never had any fear about anyone in particular. At some point, I was going to do well. And when I'm going to do well, you'll know about it. You should be thinking, mate, nick it to me, nick it to me. And I was thinking, whatever you do, don't nick it to me, for God's sake. Because you know if you drop him, you drop the game. I couldn't see, I couldn't feel, I couldn't believe that you could be better than the way he went about his play. And if self-belief was not enough, natural aggression would frequently come to the fore. The more angry I, I can get you, the better I think it will be for my batting style. We probably didn't see eye to eye, so there was always good scuffles out in the field. Rodney Hogg, the Australian fast bowler, bought him a bouncer at the MCG and hit him in the head, which was then to guard again. And uh, next ball, Hogg bowled a bouncer, and Richard hooked it about three or four rows back in the MCG. That was his retort. And then, of course, came down the pitch and tapped it. Yes. Just to make a point. In 1984, the West Indies were back in England. A series of one-day matches preceded the tests. And on the 31st of May, with the West Indies struggling at 102 for seven, Richards produced one of the finest innings ever seen in a one-day international. It was a good wicket, you know, and even so from the best of wickets, you can mock things up. And we did that day, uh, we, we lost some cheap wickets. Oh, he's gone. Yes, caught behind. All I remember is him saying is, just stay with me, stay with me. Yes, gone, he goes caught, though. 66 for nine. They were right on the ropes, nine wickets down. Michael Holding came in as the last man with the West Indies in trouble. All I had to do was survive. I was the last man in, so if I had gotten out, that would have been the end of the innings. It's a tenth wicket partnership between Viv and Michael Holding, and Mikey gave the bowling to Viv, and Viv just took our attack apart. I think he made 12, uh, but Richards just completely took the game away from England. Not shot again. Absolutely magnificent. That to me was all about being in control being able to take the strike on the fifth ball when it was a strike so that you can go and have a bat at the next end. The way things were synchronizing, to me, is one of the better performances. That's the great joy of uh, Viv Richards. <laughs> Led into that one. <laughs> Richards, in that type of mood, he just couldn't be stopped. At the end of each over, we would come down, we'd have a little chat. Sometimes it wasn't even about cricket. He just wanted to keep me relaxed and keep me, my confidence going. And he just blasted the ball all over the park. And a smile from both of them. He knows full well he should never bowl to Richards there. It's my job to be in control. I feel the last batter. You don't want your number 11 facing all six deliveries. You take control. You dictate things. And how many balls do you think you'd like him, like him to have and all that sort of stuff and um, when you think you, you, you should allow him to do so. That to me is smart thinking. That was the best one day innings that I've ever seen. Richards made 189 not out from just 170 balls. The last wicket partnership was worth 106 as England lost by 104 runs. It was a sign of things to come for the test matches. Ten weeks later, the West Indies beat England by 172 runs to secure a 5-0 series win. The first ever series whitewash by a touring side. The simple truth is they were a better side, much stronger side in every department. Anyone and everyone who played against the West Indies in the mid-80s 
knew just how tough they were. They were the best side, I think, that's ever played Test cricket. I don't have to go any further than that West Indian side of the late 70s to late 80s. Yeah, they were fantastic. February 1986 saw the West Indies, now captained by Richards, host an England side gunning for revenge. When we won the Ashes, I was caught on the balcony of the Oval saying things like, I hope the West Indies are quaking in their boots. It was said very dryly, it wasn't said seriously, but um, West Indies cricket was still incredibly strong. Um, and if I said that, it was done not to predict that we're going to do great things in the West Indies, but well, I, I was hoping we'd do better than 84. They didn't. The West Indies repeated their feat of two years earlier, winning the series 5-0. In the final test at his home stadium, the recreation ground in Antigua, Viv Richards was in the mood to entertain. They were looking for quick runs, and who better to give them quick runs than, than Richards? Or John Embry and others got launched into the road and so on, and it was before his Antiguan people. You give yourself the own license for you to throw the bat, and I got the fastest hundred at the time here in Antigua. So with the captaincy, there's a lot of responsibilities, but at the end of the day, it's about the contribution and if it's healthy enough to your team's success. A character there by the name of Mayfield used to come to the Antigua Recreation Ground for every test match with records. And every time a record was broken, he broke them. Record broken, bang, and uh, he broke so many. In front of a jubilant home crowd, Richards reached his century in just 56 balls. At the time, the fastest century in test cricket, yet another record in a burgeoning CV. I was asked at the end of that tour by Christopher Martin Jenkins from BBC Radio, he said, have you enjoyed the tour? Um, it might have been a rhetorical question. The answer was no. By the late 1980s, Viv Richards was the elder statesman of his national team. For many of his younger teammates, he was not only their captain, but the man they had grown up idolising. He's a super icon, really. <laughs> Viv is a super icon. I mean, there was something about Viv as a youngster that just sort of light me up. If I'm under the table line, I'll get up to watch the first 20 minutes or half now because that would set the tempo and you know if they're going to give you a big one or not, you know. Viv is the kind of player that will beat bowlers into submission. I've seen bowlers like they I wouldn't want to say scared, but kind of nervous to bowl to Viv. Viv. He had that kind of presence. To me, he was, you know, shoulders above, above the rest. What else can I say? I mean, those two words, I think, sums him up. He's a super icon. On the 11th of August, 1991, Viv Richards walked out at the Oval to bat for the final time, before heading into retirement following a 17-year international career. The crowd rose as one to salute a man who played not just to win, but to entertain. What Sir Gary and the great Sir Everton Weeks and the great Sir Clyde Walcott and all these guys accomplished, they were part of the relay team, and to me, I'm just a member of that relay team, passing that button, and I wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to be the one who dropped it. <laughs> you know, and it's simple as that, you know. Viv Richards ended his career as the only West Indies captain to never lose a series. In December 2002, he was named by Wisden as the greatest ever one-day batsman and the third best test batsman of all time, behind Donald Bradman and Sachin Tendulkar. But his was a career about more than just figures. For Vivian Richards was more than just a cricketer. He went into bat for an entire people. He's not afraid of anybody. Once he gets on top of you, then he's going to dominate. And he's a dominator. He will be remembered as one of the best batsmen that we had. He made you feel small as a fielding side and as a bowling side the way he walked around and had total belief in his ability. Since 1974 to now, I haven't seen a batsman better than Viv Richards. The on and outside the off stump, fantastic skill, which made him, in, to my mind, uh, the best batsman there's ever been. His impact on world cricket has been tremendous. You know, everywhere Viv goes, people want to see Viv Richards because he is a dominant batsman who's not afraid of anything. Vivian Alexander Richards is the most powerful 
figure influencing the masses than anybody else before him or since. I've never ever felt intimidated by anyone. You may get me out, you may win a few little battles along the way, but at the end of the day, I'm prepared to win the war.